Sorry, I'm just uh, completing my COVID test here since I just arrived in England. Uh, okay. Um, so I know I've given a, a talk on this before at the Turing Institute. Um, last time, uh, there were 84 questions that were asked. Uh, I had time to answer about three of them in real time, and then I did the rest by email. So I'm going to try to keep my talk fairly short and leave a lot of time for discussion. Um, so just to get everyone on the same page, right, we're talking about AI and um, since the beginning of the field with a, I would say, uh, a branch that ended up diverging into cognitive science, other than that, the main focus of AI research has been on making machines that conform to the notion of rationality that was then extant in uh, economics and philosophy. Um, so machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. And uh, as we all know, there are many different branches of AI um, that have instantiated this, for example, in problem solving. Uh, the objective is defined by the cost function and the goal set. Uh, and then the algorithm has to find the least cost path or sequence of actions leading to a state in the goal set uh, and so on. And, um, you know, in every chapter of the textbook that was just mentioned, uh, we begin with the assumption that we can specify what that ob objective is. Um, I, I've listed machine learning at the bottom here because this now in some sense underpins a lot of progress in all of the other areas. Um, I've heard my vision colleagues complain that computer vision has just become a branch of machine learning. Uh, so it's very boring. Uh, same with speech. Uh, increasingly, the same is true with natural language processing, um, but perhaps not some of the other areas as yet. Uh, but of course, we have to keep in mind that the goal of the field since the beginning has not been to build a better Go player or uh, to build a self-driving car, but to build general purpose AI. Uh, something that could quickly learn um, to perform as well as human beings or better uh, in any task environment that humans can function in and, and probably a lot more besides. Um, and the question that uh, has been uppermost in my mind for the last few years of what, is what if we succeed? Um, there has been a section of uh, the last chapter of the textbook uh, since the first edition, actually in 94, uh, called What If We Succeed, um, but I think it's become uh, more of a concern recently, partly due to progress in AI and partly due to an understand, a bit more understanding about, um, about the implications of that progress uh, and what happens if we continue along the path that we're on. Um, so if we look on the bright side, right, we could, we could use general purpose AI um, as, a, as a general purpose deliverer of economic value, material goods, services, um, and uh, do so in a way that is uh, at much greater scale and, and far, far less cost, because ultimately the cost of everything uh, comes down to how much human time went into producing it. Uh, and as you eliminate all the human time from the entire supply chain, uh, then costs essentially are driven uh, down to um, uh, the, the bargaining costs over uh, the raw materials and land uh, that, that go into production. Um, so if we were able to do that, not, so not delivering science fiction capabilities like fast and light travel, but just uh, doing what we already do for hundreds of millions of people, except doing it for all the billions of people on earth, um, it's about a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world, and that's about a $13.5 quadrillion net present value. So that's sort of the cash prize. And this is a lower bound on the cash prize because we'd probably be able to do a lot of other stuff too, um, including much better individualized healthcare, uh, much better education, uh, probably accelerated science, which I think we're already seeing. So there's, there's a lot of other benefits besides doing what we already know how to do. Um, and so uh, this, uh, this benefit, uh, this potential benefit to humanity creates the unstoppable momentum, the, 
you know, major power competition. I was just in a meeting earlier today when someone um, someone described what's happening in AI as a revival of the great game of the 19th century, the great game being essentially the imperialist, imperialist land grab uh, among all the major powers trying to, trying to get as much of the rest of the world as possible. Um, so I don't know if that's an analogy I really like, and it's certainly not one I'd encourage people to pursue. Um, but if we ask Alan Turing, of course, uh, well known to all of you, uh, what his opinion was about what happens if we succeed, it was uh, this. It seems horrible that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Um, so that's his prediction. And um, we'll see in a little bit uh, why uh, he may have thought that. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to him about it. Uh, but in the intervening, so that was 1951, in the intervening 70 years, uh, we've seen a lot of advances. And now some of the dreams of the early years are coming true. The self-driving car, the machine that uh, teaches itself to defeat human world champions in uh, nowadays, I think we would say pretty much any board game uh, and many of the video games um, that are uh, the board games of the newer generation. Um, just briefly blow the horn for some work from my own group on the global monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. This is a satellite image of North Korea showing the uh, tunnel entrance to their testing facility and then uh, the real time location estimate produced by our system NetVisa for the 20, uh, February 2013 nuclear test um, that turned out to be much more accurate uh, than the global consensus uh, in the top left of all the world's geophysicists studying uh, many more uh, seismic records than we had access to in real time. Um, and then of course there are all the downsides and I could you know, I could have a dozen slides, one, one for each misuse of artificial intelligence, but I'll just mention because, because the, um, uh, the CCW review conference is beginning in Geneva, um, where they may or may not probably won't take any action on, uh, on autonomous weapons, but uh, these weapons are already out there, already being used to kill people. Uh, not something that I think the AI community is very happy about. Um, but I also want to stress that we're not that close to general purpose AI. I don't believe that uh, any amount of scaling up of computation and data with existing ideas, uh, existing algorithms is going to reach human level AI. And there are several of these major uh, pieces that are still missing um, that require conceptual breakthroughs. Those are very hard to predict. Um, and to give you an example, uh, what happened with nuclear energy uh, in the uh, early part of the 20th century is a, is a pretty salutary warning because um, at least up until September 11th, 1933, when Lord Rutherford gave this speech uh, in Leicester, um, the physics establishment was adamant that uh, actually extracting the enormous quantity of energy that they knew to exist in atoms was impossible. Um, and then the next morning, Leo Zillard read about uh, Rutherford's speech in the Times and went for a walk and invented the neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction. So, so predictions that we don't need to worry because it's almost certainly impossible to ever produce general purpose AI uh, are, I think, just um, not tenable and not prudent. So we have to assume that um, at some point, probably not tomorrow morning, but at some point, AI systems will be more capable uh, than human beings. They'll make better real world decisions, just as they make better decisions on the go board. Uh, we'll gradually relax the assumptions uh, that are required for alpha zero to, to do well at go and generalize our algorithms and uh, be able to have systems that function well in the real world. And that brings us back to Turing's question, right? So then we're creating entities more powerful than ourselves uh, and how do we retain power over them forever? And Turing, I think, just looked at that question and said, don't see an answer. Um, but I think uh, if we try to understand more carefully where things go wrong, maybe there is an answer. 
And I think where things go wrong is in that standard model of AI, right? which is not just the standard model of AI, it's a standard model for control theory with minimizing cost functions or statistics with minimizing loss functions and operations research, maximizing reward functions and economics, maximizing utility and social welfare and other and GDP and things like that. So, um, so it's a pretty powerful model. Uh, and basically you create machines that are good at optimizing. You put in the uh, objective and then the machine uh, carries out the solution that optimizes the objective. Um, and the problem is that we don't know how to specify objectives completely and correctly in the real world. Right? It's easy to do for Go because the objective of Go is part of the definition of what it means to play Go. Um, but even for something relatively restricted like a self-driving car, uh, you might say, oh, well, the objective is to go wherever the passenger wants to be taken. But it's much more than that, right? Um, because if you said, well, uh, and do it safely, uh, you automatically actually set up a contradiction because uh, the only way to be safe is to stay in the garage, which doesn't get you to the airport. Uh, and so you've given the system an impossible task. So then you have to say, okay, well, I don't mean safety. What I mean is there's some cost attached to death, um, but then you have to trade off that cost against how, how fast you get there. Um, and you know, do you wait until the middle of the night before you go because it's much safer driving in the middle of the night when there's not much traffic, uh, unless it's Saturday night, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's turned out to be extremely hard in the real world for people to specify the objectives of uh, a self-driving car. And that's a relatively simple physical task uh, compared to running a corporation, running a government, teaching a child, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is not a new lesson, right? King Midas had his big problem with incorrect specification. Everything I touched should turn to gold. Well, that turned out to be everything that he ate, everything that he drank, uh, all the family members and so on. Um, Sorcerer's Apprentice forgets to say how much water the brooms are supposed to bring uh, when he casts the magic spell. Um, and the genie who gives you three wishes, your third wish is always undo the first two wishes because you've made a mess of the universe. Right, so, um, so this lesson, I think, should now be clear to everyone. Uh, Victoria Krakowna from DeepMind has a whole catalog of uh, instances where in the lab, AI researchers have made a mistake in specifying objectives, even for relatively simple tasks, you know, even for video games. Um, it turns out that people make mistakes over and over again in specifying objectives. Um, two kinds, right? There's, there's omission, leaving out things that you really care about. Um, and when we talk to each other, we don't usually include all those things, right? When, when I say, I'd like a cup of coffee, you don't say, I'd like a cup of coffee and you're not allowed to kill anybody in order to get it, right? Because that's an objective that we all share. And so we don't communicate the shared part of the objectives, but of course we don't share it with the machine. Uh, we have to somehow make sure that they know what those, those missing objectives are. And I think we are maybe seeing the consequences of this sort of methodology failure in social media where the algorithms that choose what um, most, not most people, but certainly most of the people who are connected to the internet uh, read and watch every day, right? They control the news feeds, they control the videos, uh, uh, the video websites and so on. Um, and their goal is to maximize click-through or engagement or some, uh, some proxy um, that is pretty well aligned with monetization, right? Um, and you might also say, well, click-through, surely that's aligned with what people want, right? You, you, in order to maximize click-through, you have to send people what they want to read, right? Well, we all know that that fails because of things like clickbait, right? And so instead of sending things you want to read, they send you things you think you want to read uh, with clickbait titles, which you then, it turns out you actually didn't want to read, but now you've clicked on it. Um, but actually it's much worse than that because this is not the solution at all, right? This would be the solution if you had uh, a one-shot decision, right? You get to send one thing and that's the, that's the end of the game. Which thing do you send? Well, you send the thing that people want to click on. 
But in fact, you can send a whole sequence of things. And because content changes people's minds, and the mind is the environment in which the algorithm is operating, right? That's the, the Markov decision process, if you like, that the algorithm uh, is functioning in, right? It's going to learn to send a sequence of content that changes your mind, your brain, uh, so that in future, you become a more predictable person who, who can then be monetized more effectively uh, by sending whatever content you now will reliably click on. Um, and at least anecdotally, people uh, have come to believe that the effects of social media algorithms have been very polarizing um, and are uh, actually tearing many countries apart and destroying uh, democratic systems. Uh, it's hard to say because we don't have access to the data uh, to confirm these things. We can't really easily do controlled experiments, but certainly the social media companies themselves appear to believe that this is the effect that they're having uh, and internal documents confirm this. So keeping in mind that these are really simple algorithms, right? They don't know that human beings exist or have minds or, or knowledge or opinions or function in a society. Uh, for them, you are simply a click history. Uh, these are the documents that were sent to you and these are the ones you clicked on. Um, so if you made the algorithms better, right? If you improved their ability to maximize the objective, the consequences would be far worse, right? Instead of taking a year or two to radicalize you, they might only take a few weeks. And, and this is actually uh, a feature of the standard model, which is that when you have incompletely or incorrectly defined objectives, the better the AI system, the worse the outcomes are going to be. Uh, and you can actually show this mathematically under fairly mild assumptions uh, about monotonicity of objectives um, because the AI system is going to essentially set the values of all the things you forgot to mention uh, to some extreme value. Think of it as minus infinity um, in order to optimize the things that you did mention. Uh, also, the AI system will be better able to prevent interference with its objectives um, because once it's been given a fixed objective, then any attempt to interfere is just an attempt to cause it to fail, uh, which it will then uh, defend itself against. So the new model that I've been working on for the last few years uh, gets rid of this idea, right? This the standard model of what it means for a machine to be intelligent and say, in fact, we don't want that. Uh, it's not a methodology that we can safely pursue as machines become more capable. What we want instead is machines that are beneficial in the sense that their actions can be expected to achieve our objectives. So our true preferences about the future as human beings, which of course are in us, not in the machine. Uh, and this is a more difficult problem for the machine, but it's not an impossible problem. Um, and uh, when you put it into a mathematical framework, um, then you can actually start to make progress and look at how uh, the resulting systems behave. Um, so there are three principles. This is just really a deference to uh, Isaac Asimov. They're different from his laws and they're not even intended as laws that the machine consults. So in, in Asimov stories, the machine actually sort of mentally consults the laws to decide what to do. And um, that's not the idea here. This is really a guide to researchers and how they set up the mathematical framework. Um, and then the mathematical framework is defining the problem that the AI system is solving. Um, and then you can understand the properties of those solutions. So the first principle says that the only thing the machine cares about is satisfying uh, what, whatever it is that humans want the future to be like. So preferences here in the, in the sense that economists use it, uh, not reveal choices, but just uh, an internal property of uh, having preferences about which future actually comes to pass. Um, and this would be preferences of everyone, not any, not any particular, uh, not just one particular individual, for example. Um, the key point is that the robot is uncertain about what those preferences are. Um, and this is what gives us, uh, I think, a chance of retaining control over the machines forever. 
Um, now, the third principle basically says, how do, we, how do we ground this notion of preferences, right? How on earth is the robot's behavior ever gonna be connected to human preferences? Um, and it's through uh, observation of human behavior because uh, at least in this version zero of the model, we have preferences. Those preferences influence our external behavior, uh, which then as a result provides evidence uh, about what the preferences must have been. Um, it's very noisy and imperfect evidence, as we'll see. So when you take those principles, you can turn them into what we call an assistance game, which is just a mathematical definition of a particular kind of decision problem. It's a game because there's two entities, uh, at least two entities, at least one human and at least one machine. And it's an assistance game because uh, in, uh, in game theoretic terminology, the payoff of the robot is the payoff of the human, uh, except that the robot doesn't know what it is. So that's the setup. Uh, and you can solve these games. You can define you know, for some particular environment, some particular human objective, uh, what's the solution? What, what does the human do? What does the machine do in this game? And uh, it seems that uh, the machines will necessarily defer to human beings. Um, they will ask permission before changing parts of the world whose value they're not sure about. Um, and uh, in the extreme case, they'll allow themselves to be switched off. And um, in general, under again, under certain assumptions, we can show it's rational for us to build machines that solve assistance games. Um, and that's a, a stronger claim than we can make for the standard model, it's, I don't think it's in general rational for us to build machines that pursue fixed objectives that, that we supply explicitly because we don't know how to do that exactly. Um, and in this model, if you, as you improve the capabilities of the AI system, it, it gets better at understanding your preferences as well as better at fulfilling them. Uh, so I found it helpful and I used this example in next week's Reef Lecture, so you'll get in the preview. Um, but I think it's helpful to, to see it, right? To see, put yourself in the shoes of the robot, right? So you're the robot. Uh, your partner, whoever you think of as your partner in real life, uh, they're the human, right? So they're the ones whose preferences actually matter. I'm sure you're already familiar with that idea. Um, and now you have to buy them a birthday present. And you have to do it. Uh, so to take money out of the equation, we'll just assume that it's coming from a joint account. Um, and as you know, uh, it's not an easy thing to buy the perfect birthday present. You may have some previous year's examples where you got it wrong. Um, that's evidence that you can use about preferences. Um, and the key point here is that your payoff in this game is precisely your partner's happiness with the present. Okay, so that, that situation that the robot is in, and you could use all kinds of strategies uh, to get a good outcome. Uh, you know, you could leave pictures of different kinds of things around the house and hope that your partner says, oh, that's a nice car, or, oh, I'd love to go on holiday to Antarctica or whatever it might be, right? Um, you could quiz their friends about, what, you know, have they dropped any hints about what they'd like for the birthday and all sorts of other strategies you could use. Um, now, this particular problem, unfortunately, is unsolvable, but the other, uh, all the other instances of assistance games we can actually solve. Um, so I just want to look at one very simple uh, assistance game, uh, which, which relates this question of whether we're going to be able to switch the machines off. Um, so this is our robot, just to, just to make things very concrete, this is our 200 kilogram robot in the lab, and it ha does have an off switch. Um, but in the, in the classical standard model of AI, you'd give it an objective, like, could you fetch the coffee? And or I suppose fetch the tea if you're in England. Um, and now just by saying that, you've given it an incentive to disable its off switch. Because being switched off, whether on purpose or by accident, uh, would prevent it from fetching the coffee. So if it wants to minimize the probability of failure, uh, it's going to take steps to disable the off switch. 
So that's not what we want to have happen. Um, and we'll see that the second principle, that uncertainty about the objectives, changes the sort of mental calculus of the robot. Um, and so we can set this up as a very simple two-step game where the robot gets to go first. And, um, and we can start out with just two choices, right? So one uh, on the right would be, well, it could just commit suicide. You could say, you know what, I'm such a terrible robot. I'm, you know, you're better off if I just commit suicide. So it could switch itself off and we'll set the value of that to the human as uh, a zero, just an arbitrary uh, value for the human of zero. Um, and the other choice is to go ahead and take some uh, potentially dangerous action. So this would be the equivalent of disabling the off switch uh, and doing something that in fact the human might be unhappy about. Uh, so pushing the bid reg button, maybe this starts a nuclear war, maybe it sets off the sprinklers in the building, um, you know, maybe it makes a cup of coffee. And um, the robot is initially uncertain about the value of this action. So it's not sure how much the human likes it. And I've depicted that here with a probability distribution over the utility of the action for the human. And in this case, the probability distribution is slightly positive in expectation. And so if those were the only two choices, the robot would just go ahead uh, and push the big red button. Um, but we could give the robot a third choice, which is just to wait and allow the human to act. And the human could switch the robot off or the human can let the robot go ahead. And the question is, why would the robot do that given that both of those choices are already available to the robot anyway? Why would it simply hand over that choice to the human? Um, and it turns out that the answer is in some sense obvious uh, because the human knows more about the utility function. Um, and if the human allows the robot to go ahead, then the robot learns that the value of the pressing bed brick button is better than the value of being switched off. And so the negative quadrant in this distribution disappears. Uh, the big red button now has a higher expected value for the, from the robot's point of view, and it's safe for the robot to go ahead and push the big red button. So this branch allowing itself to be switched off by the human turns out to be uh, higher in expected value than the branch of pushing the big red button at the beginning. And, uh, and this is a very simple theorem. It's completely trivial to prove. Um, and it has, therefore, the robot has the positive incentive to allow itself to be switched off, uh, to take the middle choice, the weight action, um, as long as it's uncertain about the choice that the human will make. As soon as it becomes certain about what the human would do if given the chance, um, then there's no longer any value to allowing the human to do it because it can do those, uh, it can just do that choice anyway. And so the uncertainty about the human preferences is what gives the human control over this robot. Um, you can also show under certain assumptions that uh, a robot designed this way is actually provably beneficial to the human being. So in expectation, you're just better off having this robot than not having the robot. So um, there are tons of other research questions that remain uh, to be explored. And I sort of grouped them under these headings. Uh, one is decision-making on behalf of many humans, which is something that moral philosophers and economists have studied for thousands of years. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the fact that we also are gonna have many machines. And if you know anything about game theory, um, uh, then you know that uh, when you put two or more decision makers together, uh, even with the best of intentions, they can end up with the worst of outcomes. Um, so how do we avoid those sort of prisoner's dilemma failures uh, when many machines are there? Um, I mentioned that uh, human behavior is not a perfect indicator of human preferences. Uh, and that's because our decision making isn't perfectly rational and therefore uh, to fulfill the third principle, it will help if we have better understanding of uh, the actual human cognitive architecture and how preferences turn into, uh, into behavior. Um, and then if we solve all that, right, we then have to rebuild AI because uh, as I mentioned, every area of AI 
assumes a fixed known objective. And when that assumption is no longer valid, uh, then all the algorithms and all the theorems and everything uh, have to be rebuilt. Uh, and it's actually rebuilt on a much bigger foundation um, because perfect knowledge of the objective is just the special case, right? The general case is uncertainty about the objective. Uh, and it turns out that when there's uncertainty about the objective, the behaviors that AI systems can exhibit are much richer, right? A, a system with a known fixed objective never needs to ask permission about, is it okay if I do this, right? Because it already knows what the objective is and, and that its solution optimally satisfies the objective. Um, and then we have to, I think, develop prototypes actually instantiating the methodology uh, in real areas. Um, so let me talk about um, real humans and some of the major questions, right? And, and it has to do with the fact that human preferences are translated into behavior in an imperfect way. For example, uh, you know, Lisa Doll, the Go player that was depicted earlier, uh, plays losing moves against uh, AlphaGo. And if you thought that Lisa Doll was rational, then the only conclusion would be that he wanted to lose the game. Right? And that would be an incorrect inference about his underlying preferences. Uh, a better explanation would be that he wants to win the game, but sometimes his computational limitations cause him to make losing moves. And um, so to understand human behavior means to understand our imperfections. Um, and uh, you know, a good example would be uh, emotionally driven behavior, which we usually regret um, almost immediately. Uh, and again, you wouldn't want to assume that the emotionally driven behavior is a true reflection of our real underlying preferences. Um, but sometimes some of our subsystems uh, take over and produce actions that are not, our, not in our own best interest. Um, I think there are some very difficult questions about uh, our preference for autonomy and agency. What that means in this context, I think, is that AI systems have to allow us to take actions that aren't in our own best interests, right? So if you think about our best interests as being on the motorway or on the freeway, um, should the AI system sort of block off all the exits, right? So to make sure that we stay on the path of our own best interests. And I think the answer is no, um, because it's sort of paradoxical, right? I mean, you might say, yes, of course it should do that, but no, if it does that, it takes away our autonomy which is part of what we care about. So in fact, it wouldn't be the freeway um, since it would, it would, we would no longer have autonomy if we were driving along it. Um, and formalizing th those considerations is quite tricky, I think. Uh, the main issue about humans that makes uh, the theory that I pre presented so far inadequate is plasticity of human preferences. Like the fact that um, they, uh, our preferences are moldable by external influences. And obviously, right, we didn't just come into being with our, you know, our full set of adult preferences about the future. Um, they arose because of a process of maturation, because of our biology, because of our society. Um, and plasticity of preferences leads to several difficult questions, right? One is um, that if the AI system is going to do something that's going to take effect in the future, right? Should it take the choices that you currently would prefer that it take? Or should it take the choices that you will prefer that it takes uh, when the time comes? And uh, I don't think we have a straightforward answer to that question. We also have to make sure, since they are plastic, we have to make sure that AI systems are not going to manipulate our preferences so, so as to be easier to satisfy. And then maybe the most difficult question is, is that if our preferences are subject to these external influences, some of which are deliberate indoctrination, for example, uh, can produce preferences that are good for the indoctrinator, but not for the subject um, to possess. And so should AI systems take our preferences at face value? Uh, and if not, which ones should it take at face value and which ones should it uh, view as being uh, the result of malign exogenous forces. And these questions are really hard, but I think uh, to some extent, we're going to have to answer them. Um, and then there's many humans. Um, 
probably the first thing that you might have thought is, well, you know, how do you deal with the fact that everyone has different preferences? Well, that's, that's just a fact of life. Um, I suspect that we actually have a lot more in common than uh, is commonly believed, uh, which makes it then easier to learn the preferences of a new person. Uh, you can make many inferences uh, uh, that will help you uh, understand their behavior and, and make guesses uh, that are quite reasonable in most cases. Um, the difficult problem comes from trade-offs and these arise whether we have all the same preferences or, or whether we have all different preferences, there are still going to be trade-offs. Um, and, uh, and this is the, you know, at the core of how moral philosophers uh, think about what's, uh, what's a good or bad decision for an AI system to make. Um, and philosophers are very good at finding bugs in simple uh, naive formulations. Um, so, for example, in critiquing utilitarianism, um, Nozick talks about the difficulty of interpersonal comparisons of preferences. He talks about the utility monster whose preference scale is a thousand times bigger than ordinary people's preference scales. Uh, and utilitarianism might end up giving basically a thousand times more weight to, to that utility monster's preferences. Uh, than to the preferences of other people. Um, and if you think that that question doesn't make sense, well, how, you know, what does it mean to say one person's preference scale is a thousand times bigger than other people? Well, if you think that doesn't make sense, then how on earth are you going to trade off people's preferences if you don't think that you can make any such comparison at all? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, I'll show in a minute that uh, uh, even just dealing with the fact that people have different beliefs makes the standard uh, sort of additive aggregation approach invalid. Um, and then there are questions that, you know, again, philosophers have thought about for a long time, uh, actions that change population size. So when China had a one-child policy, they got rid of 500 million people who would otherwise be alive today. Was that a good thing? You know, how do you weigh up the interests of people who never existed? Uh, against the interests of people who did exist when you make those kinds of decisions. And if you've seen uh, the recent Avengers movies, right, you know that Thanos, right, he just does a simple calculation that if we got rid of half the people, uh, everyone who was left would be more than twice as happy. Um, and therefore it's moral for him to get rid of half the people in the universe. Um, and this turns out to be probably not what you want the AI system to do. Um, but, you know, it does result from at least a simple-minded calculation of, of aggregate utilities. Uh, so as our systems approach Thanos levels of power, uh, it becomes more and more urgent to have the right answers to these, uh, what used to be called philosophical questions. Um, so let me briefly mention this idea uh, about aggregating human preferences, right? Um, and the standard theory, uh, in, at least in the utilitarian literatures, and, and, and they're the ones that I think most AI researchers gravitate to most naturally, um, comes, among other things, from a theorem by uh, Hassani, who's an econ economist, Nobel Prize winner, um, died a few years ago at Berkeley. And um, his theorem, the social aggregation theorem, says that every Pareto optimal policy, which means a policy that isn't strictly dominated by uh, some other policy. In other words, uh, that it's a, a policy that isn't uh, necessarily preferred um, by at least one person and where everyone else is indifferent. So Pareto optimal is a minimal uh, criterion for rational behavior. And, um, and he shows that under certain very weak and very natural assumptions that um, you should optimize a linear combination of the preferences of the individuals or the utility functions of the individuals. Um, but the assumption required for this theorem to go through is that everyone has a common prior about the future. So the utility function describes a value for each possible future, um, but everyone has to believe that 
all the futures have the same, you know, they all have to believe the same probabilities for all the futures. And um, this common prior is probably unreasonable if you've ever met human beings. Um, so what happens when we get rid of it? What happens when people are allowed to have different beliefs about how the future is going to unfold? Well, it turns out that then all prey to optimal policies have dynamic weights for the preferences of the individuals. And those weights are proportional to the likelihood, the probability of any particular future that unfolds. Okay. Um, and so if you have the wrong beliefs about the future, and now the future turns out to be not what you thought, but what someone else has thought, then their preferences will end up having much higher weight than your preferences. And you might say, well, how could this be, right? It sounds extremely inegalitarian and unfair, right? But this is the only policy that people will agree to, right? And then that's because everyone thinks their own beliefs are reasonable. Right? And so they think they're going to win with a policy of this kind, right? That, that rewards them for being right. And so uh, they're not going to agree to any kind of fixed weighting because this is much better from their point of view. Um, so what these, think, what these considerations suggest is that uh, we have to be pretty careful when we think about decision-making on behalf of multiple individuals. And the answers are not always the straightforward, simple ones that you might think. Um, looking at the, the relationships among the, uh, the robots themselves, right? As I said, when you've got billions or trillions of, of uh, AI systems operating in the world, how do we make sure that they don't have catastrophic uh, game theoretic interactions with each other, right? And you, so you, even though, so even if they all share the same objective, uh, there's still possibly going to be coordination issues among the robots themselves. And um, one of the research scientists at, at Berkeley, uh, Andrew Quitch, has been developing something called open source game theory. Um, and it, so it, it assumes that the, the computer agents are going to make available either their code or some uh, mathematical properties of their code, uh, which can be encrypted uh, but still checkable. So it doesn't, it doesn't you don't have to give away all your intellectual property, um, but the algorithms can then start to prove theorems about each other. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, again, these could be quite counterintuitive results. So if, if two agents have the property that uh, in a prisoner's dilemma, they go. All right, so we're, uh, we're back again. Okay, sorry, I don't know. I guess my uh, internet crashed, but seems to have rebooted itself. Okay, uh, right. So I think, yeah, wrapping up, um, I think, uh, you know, in, in the absence of fully worked out technological solutions for how we make uh, the provably beneficial AI systems, I think there are some steps people could take early on to avoid this failure mode. Um, and, uh, and some of them I think are, are beginning to be encoded in EU AI regulations um, for high-risk systems, for example. Um, but basically I think what the, ma the main thing is figure out what objective you're actually asking the system to optimize and then whether uh, that objective is actually lined up uh, with human interests within the scope of action of your system. If you think about uh, what effect could your system have, you know, in the limit on the world uh, if it carried out any arbitrary sequence of actions that it's capable of carrying out? Um, does your uh, stated objective for that system actually line up with human interests? And one thing that's completely obvious from this is um, that the standard objective for machine learning, which is um, maximizing accuracy or minimizing errors on the training set, uh, is obviously not lined up with human interests because we care, for example, about fairness uh, and max maximizing accuracy on the training set is not aligned with fairness. And so, um, so arguably the, all the problems with bias uh, result at least in part from uh, misspecification of the objective uh, of the learning system. Um, you can also look at 
you know, what happened with social media or is happening still with social media uh, in the same light as a, a misspecification of the objective. And there, right, the scope of action of these systems is really enormous, right? You're talking about billions of copies of the algorithm directly interacting with billions of people uh, with almost no constraint on what they can do because the content that they can send to people is pretty much arbitrary. Um, and so uh, the, the scope of action of these systems is enormous. I mean, don't forget Hitler did it with words, right? Hitler was not a thousand foot tall robot with laser, laser eyes and you know, all the rest of it, right? He just did it with words. Um, so the scope of action of systems that interact with human beings through text or through the screen uh, is almost unlimited. Uh, and that means that it's very hard to say um, that the objectives uh, that the system is optimizing are actually aligned with human interests. Um, and so my sense is that we're going to need much stricter regulation of those kinds of systems and, and probably a complete system redesign. So if you're interested, there's the, the non-technical version is in the book, Human Compatible and the the technical version to the extent that it exists is in the fourth edition. Um, but as I said, we still need to redo all the technical foundations, the algorithms, the complexity, the, um, you know, the experiments and develop the technology itself um, so that we can have provably beneficial AI systems. Um, so this is the summary. AI is moving ahead. It's gonna be really hard to stop it. Um, so we better figure out how to avoid this failure mode uh, that is going to get worse and worse as AI systems get better and better. Um, and if we do it this other way, I think we can get provably beneficial AI. Uh, and it's actually what we would have wanted all along. Uh, we just took a shortcut that seemed like the right thing to do at the time, uh, but actually it wasn't the right thing. Um, and I, want, I don't want people to think of this as like AI ethics where you know, ethicists say bad, 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 wag their fingers at the AI researchers, right? I want it to be the case that when an AI researcher gets out of bed in the morning uh, and says, okay, I'm gonna do some really good AI today, right? They don't say, oh, I'm gonna finally, I'm gonna to listen to those insufferable ethicists, right? They say, I'm gonna do some really good AI today. And what that means uh, is uh, making AI systems that are provably beneficial to humans, just as what it means to be a good doctor is to heal your patient. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Russell, for such an uh, inspiring uh, talk. I'd like now to open the floor for questions. You know, please uh, uh, post your questions in uh, the Q&A uh, top. And I'll, I'll get started with a question from uh, Ben Daniels. And this is, uh, can uh, the provably uh, beneficial AI have a perform a task better than a human, given it is limited to a potentially limited human view of our best interests? Uh, yes, absolutely, it can perform better. Um, I mean, you know, if, if, you, if you just want something to play really good chess, um, you know, you're limited in your ability to do that by, uh, by your, you know, fairly old fashioned brain and uh, the AI systems can just do a better job of playing chess moves than you can. So if that's your objective, the AI systems will do it better. So there's no, there's no limit um, placed on the AI system in terms of how much it can benefit humans by the fact that it's uh, trying to uh, bring about conditions that meet our preferences. Um, and in fact, you, would, you wouldn't really want it to do anything else. I mean, we could, we could build AI systems that are indexed to the preferences of cockroaches, but we don't want that. We don't want to do that, right? It doesn't make sense for us to do it. Maybe the cockroaches can do that, but we don't want to do that, right? We want to do what's in, what's in our interest. Um, so the technology, yes, theoretically, it would be capable, right, of, of being repurposed for other species who might have different or maybe even better if, the, if that means something preferences than we do but I don't think it's right for us AI researchers to tell humans what their preferences ought to be um, that's a, above our pay grade so to speak 
All right, very good. Uh, there's uh, another question from uh, uh, Colin Rowat, uh, and uh, it refers to the assistance game. And uh, presumably there's been a lot of thought about what happens when humans' preferences are in conflict. In the extreme, Harrell's impossibility theorem says uh, you can't aggregate human preferences consistently with some fairly appealing axioms. Can you recommend uh, any good starting points, take home lessons here? Yeah, so that's an interesting, uh, it's a very interesting discussion. It gets a little bit technical, but Arrow's theorem is not about preferences in this sense, right? It's about choices. So if humans say, this is, this is my preferred action, and this is my preferred action, this is my preferred action, right? There's no way to aggregate actions correctly. And you get similar things for voting, you know, uh, vote, you know systems of voting. There are, there are always ways of, of making a paradox out of it. But if you aggregate Q functions, right? Q function being uh, for each possible action, how desirable is that uh, to each person? Right, so it's a it's more information. It's not just this is my preferred action, but this is how happy I would be with all the possible actions. If you then add up the Q functions, uh, then that's a perfectly viable solution to the aggregation problem. In fact, that's basically what Hassani is proposing. Um, so actually, the 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 impossibility theorems and social aggregation just pass in the night because they're talking about different things. All right, very good. Uh, Let me actually, I'll, just add, I'll add, add one more thing, actually. If you look at Arrow's paper, he says, we take it as a premise of this work that interpersonal comparison of utilities are meaningless. Right? So literally what that means is that if Jeff Bezos has to wait one microsecond longer for his private jet to arrive, you cannot trade that off against a mother watching her baby die of starvation over three months, right? These are simply just incomparable. You can't say one is worse or better than the other. And so you can't make any trade-offs. That's an axiom of, of Arrow's paper, right? Does Arrow believe that? I don't think so. Do you believe that? Probably not. Right, so I don't know why we're so hung up on paradoxes that arise from assuming axioms that we don't believe. All right, very good, thank you so much. Uh, there's um, a few other questions. Uh, I'll relay one by uh, an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, um, how do you keep the AI from manipulating the human into feeling happy with a bad solution? Uh, yeah, so this is a good question. Um, so the things that the AI system is supposed to be optimizing are the true underlying human preferences about the future, not just human expression about happiness, right? So, uh, so that type of deception wouldn't make sense because that would be the AI system saying, well, I'm not going to satisfy true human preferences. I'm just going to fool the human into thinking that they should be happy. Right, so that that shouldn't happen. Uh, that shouldn't happen in this case. But the you know the underlying question of you know how difficult is it to infer human preferences from human behavior? This is a really tough question. Um, and yeah, you know humans can express happiness with things, but they may be fooling themselves. Right, they might think that the outcome is actually what they want, but that's only because they have a very short-term outlook and um, you know, maybe in the long run, this is gonna be worse for them. So there are, there are lots and lots of complications uh, in actually getting this to work. But I think you know, ultimately um, you can, right? This is sort of a physics problem, right? Where if you think that, roughly speaking, the model is humans have preferences theta and they produce behavior f of theta where F is the cognitive architecture of the human, right? It's sort of a physics problem to infer what F is, right? And then once you've inferred what F is, and then you observe the behavior, then the preference is theta or F to the minus one of the behavior, right? So that at a high level, that's, what, uh, that's what's going on. And I think, you know, you only have to make a couple of very, very simple assumptions to, to make this problem mm -hmm. essentially identifiable. 
Very good. So um, I, I take the opportunity uh, by relaying one question from uh, Rachel uh, Julian. Uh, it actually relates to some of the topics that have been discussed in uh, the panel uh, just before uh, this session. And uh, the question is, uh, is it a contribution of cognitive psychology and neuroscience to determine human preferences and objectives? Uh, how can other disciplines you know, start to engage with AI design if it remains so technical? Um, so I think there are, there are a lot of ways um, because it, it, one, one place is if, if you think about the best practice slide that I put up, right? You're, you wanna understand what's the impact of the AI system on the environment that it can affect, right? When you think about, for example, putting a you know, triage system into a hospital emergency room, it's not just does it make good decisions, but how does the whole system adjust uh, as a consequence of having that system there? You know, what's the social effect of all the social media algorithms, right? So it's not just that the person gets to read the thing that they click on, but um, deploying that system at scale in society is having all these massive effects which we need to understand. Um, and so if you think about the relationship between civil engineering and city planning, right? The civil engineers, they can build bridges and they can cover anything with concrete or asphalt that you ask them to, right? And they're very good at doing that. But which things should be covered in asphalt and where should the bridges be put? Uh, you know, that's city planning. And you know, the city planners have to think not just about is the bridge going to fall down, but you know, what's it, what effect is it going to have on traffic? Is it going to be economically valuable? Is it going to destroy uh, you know, old neighborhoods by filling them with traffic? Is you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And that discipline doesn't really exist for for AI or even for computer systems generally, right? I mean, I don't think it informatics may have had that as part of its goal, um, but it hasn't really fulfilled that mission. Um, and so I think there are, there's enormous scope for um, social scientists to contribute to this. In fact, at Berkeley, uh, a whole bunch of social scientists wanted to actually leave their own departments and create a new department called Human Technology Futures, which is precisely about understanding how society and technology interact and should coexist.